It is now my pleasure to turn the webcast over to Dr. Peter Hurst, Executive Director, MIT Sloan Executive Education. Dr. Hurst, the floor is yours. Uh, thanks very much. Hello, everyone. I'm Peter Hurst from MIT Sloan Executive Education. Uh, welcome to the latest in our Innovation at Work webinar, in which we bring thought leadership from the MIT Sloan School uh, to you all around the world. We have, I think, around 750 people registered for this uh, webinar, uh, and so we're looking forward to a very uh, enjoyable and interactive session. Please feel free to ask questions as the uh, webinar goes on, and uh, towards the end, we'll have an opportunity to ask some of those questions uh, of our guest today, uh, with which I'd like to turn to uh, Professor Zainab Ton, who is an adjunct associate professor of operations uh, management at the MIT Sloan School and author of the recent and, I might say, quite highly acclaimed uh, book on the Good Jobs Strategy. Uh, professor Ton spent seven years as an assistant professor in the technology and operations management at uh, Harvard Business School, where she won a faculty teaching award for teaching excellence. Uh, and uh, we're very pleased that she uh, more recently has joined the MIT Sloan School, where her teaching and her research uh, continue to be at a very high level. Uh, and Professor Torn, in fact, does teach in several of our executive education uh, programs that we'll talk a little bit about later. So with that, I'd like to hand over uh, to Professor Torn, and perhaps I could start just by asking you, what is the good job strategy? Okay, thank you so much, Peter, and I will talk about what's the good job strategy, but first, thanks for everyone uh, to be on this call. I know that there is an exciting uh, soccer or football, as we say it in the rest of the world, uh, game going on between the United States and Germany. So thanks for taking the time, even, um, even though there's a more exciting event outside. Um, so Peter asked me, what is the good job strategy? I will start with that. So the good job strategy that I will talk to you about today is a strategy that uh, creates great returns, you know, generates great returns for investors and great value for customers while creating good jobs for employees. And, and the good job strategy is uh, possible even in highly competitive industries like low-cost retail. So it doesn't really depend on charging customers um, more, you know, higher prices. Um, but, but, but the good job strategy, and this is the, this is the highlight of, of my presentation today, requires two main things. One is it requires a different way to think about employees. So instead of thinking about employees as a cost to be minimized, uh, to think about employees as a strategic asset. And it also requires a different approach to managing the work that employees do. Um, and I will talk about that in detail. During the, during the webinar. Uh, first, let me give you a sense of how I came to start, you know, study this um, and, 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 and found about good job strategy. What I will do is I will focus on one industry, which is retail. Um, I know that many of you in this call are not from the retail industry, but I hope you'll find the lessons applicable to your settings, and I'll be happy, happy to address questions about how, how, how that might be so. So, so, so first, let me start with the status quo um, in the United States and in, in lots of other uh, developed countries about what the job status is and the consequences for businesses. So, if I were a retailer and I were and I was looking to hire someone uh, and put out an advertisement for 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 that, um, the ad would look something like this. Um, I can't see your faces, but I am assuming that many of you are kind of smiling or even laughing because this looks funny, you know, full-time store help wanted, poverty level wages, chaotic schedules, no training, poorly designed work, no meaning or purpose, and if you want this job, contact badjob at retail.com. Um, it looks funny, but actually the reality is not very different than, than what I have on this slide. So if you take a, a salesperson, retail salesperson, for example, and there were more than 4 million of them in 2012, uh, the median age in 2012 was $10.15 an hour. If you take a cashier, it's even less. It's around uh, $9 an hour. So even if you are a full-time salesperson working 40 hours a week, every single week, uh, you would be making about $21,000 a year, which is below the poverty threshold for a family of four. And, 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 and apart from um, low wages, uh, most retailers provide their schedule, employees their schedules one or two weeks in advance, and those 
schedules change all the time, which makes it very hard for employees to find another job or pursue education or, 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 or have a stable life. And apart from low wages and, 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 and unpredictable schedules, um, the jobs are designed in a way that makes people almost worthless. One of the retail employees that I've talked to um, said to me, and she's a college graduate who's, who worked at an advertising agency for, for a long time, she said to me, um, we are throwaways who are a dime a dozen, just human robots really. And, and you might be thinking as I'm, as I'm walking through this job description that, yeah, but these are jobs that kids have or high school students have or, or college students and they're not supporting families. Let me give you just one uh, piece of data, which is that the median wage of a retail worker is 38. So, so this is the job that they have to support their families. So obviously you can think about why bad jobs like this could be bad for employees and for society, but what I will talk about today is these bad jobs, in fact, uh, cost companies a lot more than they may realize. Um, in, in the retail industry, what I found is that um, when companies offer bad jobs, employee turnover is very high, um, the, the stores are not staffed properly, then there are lots of operational problems. In fact, um, as Peter mentioned, I am an operations management professor, so my specialty is operations, not human resources, not strategy. The reason that I started talking about, you know, I started researching good jobs and why they're good for business was because of all the operational problems that I started seeing early on in my research um, that were costing companies a lot of money. So let me, let me give you a few examples of these um, uh, operational problems. So, so in my, my dissertation work was with um, Borders Group. Uh, Borders, as you might know, is a book, was a book retailer, and they're not with us anymore. Um, they're not with us anymore, not because I did research with them, but, but because, um, because of lots of other things. But what we found in Borders was that one in six uh, customers who approach a salesperson for help experience what we call a phantom stuck out. So the product was there, physically there in the store, but no one was able to find it. Um, in, in, in retail stores, in a wide range of retail environments, this phantom stuck out, the fact that the product is somewhere in the store but no one can find it, is a big problem. In fact, a lot of retailers spend all this money in their supply chains to get the right product to the right store at the right time, and then the product gets stuck, let's say, in the back room and never makes it to the selling floor. So all that investment in the supply chain does not produce a good result for, for, for the customer because the customer still experiences a stuck out. So phantom stuck out is just one of the problems. Um, another very common problem in retail is inventory data inaccuracy. So we hear about all the cool things that retailers do with their data, but what we have found in our research is that much of that data are actually inaccurate. So this chart that I have here comes from the research of Nicole De Horatius from University of Chicago, and what she has is on the x-axis absolute error. So this is the error between what the system thinks that the store has an inventory of a particular product, let's say um, a bottle of water. So the system, the inventory system thinks that they have 10 units of that product, but in fact, in, in reality, they only have eight. So that will produce an absolute error of a quantity of two. So what this chart has is um, inventory data inaccuracy that comes from thousands of different products. And what you see is that 35% of the products had no inaccuracy. So the absolute error is zero. So they had accurate inventory records. But the remaining 65% of the SKUs had inaccurate inventory records. Um, and one of the reactions that we got when we presented these, uh, these data to a bunch of retailers came from uh, HEB, um, a, a successful grocery chain in, in, based in Texas. The VP of supply chain said, how did they get the 35% right? How is it that 35% of their SKUs have no inaccuracy? Because he said that every year they sell 25% more medium red tomatoes than they ever receive to their stores. Um, how is that possible? Well, a HEB supermarket has lots of different types of tomatoes. So for a checkout cashier who has been there for two weeks um, 
any type of tomato looks like a medium red tomato, so they scan it that way. So, so inventory data inaccuracy is, is, is another uh, very common problem. Third is um, promotion compliance. So manufacturers and retailers have all these promotions that they work on together, so they're going to promote certain things for sale at certain uh, times. But 50% of those promotional displays are either not uh, put up at all or, 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 not, um, or, or, or late. So these are the types of problems that I started seeing earlier on in my research, and these are driven by lack of investment in, in, in employees. In fact, what I found in my research is that most retailers were operating in what I call a vicious cycle, so the vicious cycle of retailing. And the vicious cycle of retailing starts with um, on, on the very right side of your screen you see low quality or quantity of people. So this vicious cycle starts with the mentality that labor is just a cost to be minimized. When you see labor like that, when you see labor just as a cost to be minimized, then you do everything possible to minimize that cost. And that includes um, not paying employees much, not investing in their training, um, in their jobs, or it may also mean just not having enough people on the selling floor. So having too few people um, to do everything that needs to be done. And this low quality or quantity of people drives the operational problems that I told you about. Phantom stockouts, data inaccuracy, promotion noncompliance. There are lots of other problems um, that happen inside retail stores. And in your own settings, you might think of uh, other operational execution problems uh, that happen. Um, when these problems happen, then sales are lower and profits are lower. Because um, and and when sales are lower, then um, labor budgets are lower. Because at most retailers, labor budgets are set as a function of as a percentage of sales. And when labor budgets are lower, of course, uh, companies cannot invest in their employees, and then this vicious cycle continues. So the first, um, the first phase of my research, maybe seven, eight years, I kept studying companies that operated in this vicious cycle. And, and what I kept hearing over and over um, from executives, um, from even academics, was that this vicious cycle was um, the way life had to work in, if, if, if you operate a low-cost uh, business. So. Um, it was the conventional wisdom was that this was the only way to operate because if suddenly retailers were to increase uh, their investment in their employees in terms of either higher wages or more training or more employees, then they would either have to increase prices or reduce their profits. Again, if you think that labor is just a cost, and you increase that cost, of course, the result will be either higher prices or, or, or lower margins. Um, but in the second part of my research, I found that this conventional wisdom was actually not, uh, not right. Um, the trade-off between low prices and good jobs was a false trade-off, just like how the trade-off between um, quality and cost was a false trade-off in manufacturing decades ago. So in the second part of my research, um, I started looking for companies that operate in what I call a virtuous cycle of retail. And, and I wondered, you know, can I find these companies? So the virtuous cycle would start like this. The virtuous cycle would start with the mentality that labor is not just a cost, but employees can be a strategic asset. And then it will start with an investment in employees, which would be, you know, the outcome of which would be good quality and quantity of people. And once you have that, then you would have good operational execution. You wouldn't have those phantom stockouts problems, data inaccuracy problems, etc. You would uh, provide good service to your customers. And then, of course, your sales and profits will be higher. And then when your sales are higher, now your labor budgets are higher. Now you can invest in your employees, and then this virtuous cycle will continue. So I, I went on a, um, on a quest to find companies that operated in this virtuous cycle, and I was particularly looking for low-cost companies, so companies that competed on the basis of low prices. And my first stop was in Spain. 
and it was a Spanish supermarket chain. Uh, it's called Mercadona. Mercadona is, in fact, Spain's largest supermarket chain. They operate more than 1,300 stores. Their sales are around 20 billion euros. So it's a large company. And Mercadona has been thriving financially in Spain, uh, in a country that is not really um, thriving in, in any way. Um, so what I saw at Mercadona was a large, financially very successful company. If you know, if you are interested in in, in the book, I talk about how you know, Mercadona's performance is so much better than its competitors vis-a-vis -vis lots of different metrics like sales per square foot, labor productivity, uh, lots of other um, metrics. But at the same time, Mercadona offers the lowest prices to its customers. Period. They have the lowest prices in Spain, and they provide good jobs. Just to give you a sense of how good the jobs are, uh, first they offer their employees de decent wages. Um, new full-time employees' salaries are uh, double, about double the minimum wage, and they receive a bonus, one month or two months of bonus, depending on how long they've been there. 85% of employees at Mercadona are full-time employees, and they are salaried employees with stable schedules. Remember I told you earlier that most retailers provide their employees their schedules one or two weeks in advance, and they change those all the time. And that's the case for not just part-timers, but also full-time employees and even hourly managers. At Mercadona, every full-time employee receives their schedules one month in advance, and they work in shifts, and it's stable. Um, apart from decent pay and predictable schedules, Mercadona sets its employees up for success. They provide four weeks of training to their employees. They spend 5,000 euros per employee in their training, and they promote from within. All their store managers are promoted from, um, from within, and their employee turnover is 3.4%. And um, when, I, when, I, when I was spending time with Mercadona in Spain, and they told me that their employee turnover was 3.4%, I honestly didn't believe them uh, because this just sounds way too low. I thought that the Spanish had a different way of um, measuring turnover. But then I kept asking, you know, how exactly do you measure turnover? And it's exactly how we measure turnover, which is the average number of, you know, the number of people who left divided by the average number of employees. So it is extremely low. So Mercadona is my first example of a company that has low prices, good jobs, and great performance. My second example of, a, of, of such a company was now we're going from uh, Spain to Tulsa, Oklahoma, and we're going from a supermarket ch setting to convenience store setting. So Quick Trip is a convenience store chain with gas stations, um, but it is, they have over 600 stores, more than $8 billion in, in sales. Again, a very successful company. Uh, if I were to look at some of the performance measures, Quick Trip store profits, at the time I looked at them, this was 2010, um, is 89% higher than not the average in their industry, but the top quartile in their industry. Their employees are a lot more productive. Their shrink is a lot lower. It's less than half the industry average. So when you look at Quick Trip from a, a financial success standpoint, very successful, and they are growing. Um, and Quick Trip, just like Mercadona, offers the lowest prices in the convenience store uh, setting. In some categories, their prices are as low as Walmart's, which is, which is not a convenience store chain. Um, and their gas prices are the lowest, period. And just like Mercadona, Quick Trip also offers good jobs. In fact, convenience store chain with gas stations has been in Fortune's 100 best companies to work for, 12 years in a row. Imagine a convenience store chain with gas stations. Why are Quick Trip employees happy about their jobs? Well, first they get a decent pay. Um, if you are, a, just to give you an example, you know, if you're a part-time employee um, starting out and this is not your, you know, this is just your transition job, you start around eight, nine dollars an hour, depending on the location. But if you are a full-time assistant manager starting out, the entry as an entry-level manager, you make about thirty-five to forty thousand dollars, depending on the location, and you receive, um, and and part of your pay is also a performance-based bonus. Like Mercadona, Quick Trip offers stable schedules for all its managers, assistant managers, and, and most of its full-timers. And just like Mercadona, 
uh, Quick Trip sets its employees for success. It provides lots of opportunities for growth. They do internal promotion, and they spend a lot of time training. So here's another example of a company um, that was able to offer good jobs, low prices, great performance at the same time. And in fact, I found that there were other companies that were doing the same, uh, which, which are Costco Wholesale, which most of you must be familiar with, and, and Trader Joe's, another American uh, supermarket chain. Now, when I looked at these companies, um, when I studied them, I found that these companies uh, were not just offering, you know, higher wages to their employees and everybody was happy and, and everything was fine. These companies, I found, were indeed following a very different strategy than their competitors. And, and I call this the good job strategy. And the good job strategy really has um, two different components. The first one is, and, and, and one thing actually before I talk about the good job strategy, when, when you look at the companies on this list, Costco, Trader Joe's, Mercadona, Quick Trip, what you see is that there are so many differences among them. Their customers are different, their products, the products they sell are different, the type of stores they have is different, um, their locations are different, so none of these can really be the reason why they are able to do what they are doing. Costco, the reason that Costco can offer good jobs and low prices and, and um, great performance, great returns to its shareholders, is not because Costco is a members club, because Trader Joe's is not, and Quick Trip is not, and Mercadona is not. The reason that Mercadona can do this is not because they operate in Spain, because the others can't, don't operate in Spain. The reason that Quick Trip can do this is not because they're a private company. Costco is a public company. So, so there, are lots of, there are lots of differences among these companies, and those differences cannot explain why they perform the way that they perform. When I analyzed them, I found that they were actually doing some things exactly the same way, and that's, that's what I call the good job strategy. So the first component of the good job strategy is that these companies don't see their employees as just a cost to be minimized but they see their employees as a strategic asset, so they invest in their employees. They pay higher wages, they offer more training, um, et cetera. So, so, so the first component is investment in people, but the second component is equally important. Anytime you make a big investment in something, you want to ensure that you get a high return on that investment. So these companies invest in their people, and they ensure that their employees are as productive as they can be. They're, they make sure that their employees can deliver as great ter customer service as they can, and they make sure that their employees can play a huge role in driving the, uh, company performance, company profits. And they do that through making a set of very smart choices. And when I looked at these companies, I found four choices uh, that, that they made that allowed them to transform their investment in people into high performance. So let me go through um, each one of these choices. So the first one is these companies offer less. And I know this sounds unintuitive, um, but, but, but just bear with me. So in retail, the tendency, and in, in lots of service environments, the tendency is to offer everything to customers offer more products, offer more promotions, offer longer hours. Um, but these companies um, instead offer fewer products. Um, they offer fewer promotions, and, and they just you know, have the mentality of offering less. Offering less reduces their cost substantially. Offering less ensures that their employees can do their tasks much, much faster and without errors. So if you are in charge of, remember the tomato example that I gave earlier with, um, with HEB, how they, every year they sold 25% more medium red tomatoes than they ever received to their stores? Of course, when there are 15 types of tomatoes, employees might confuse them. But when there are just a few types, then it will be much easier for employees to manage them, and it, it will be much easier for them to, um, to do their jobs faster and, and without errors. And it would also be much easier for them to be familiar with the products that their store carries and, and, and talk to customers about those products. So, so offering less is, is, is one of the pillars of the good job strategy. The second one, the second, uh, and, and offering less, you know, if you look at uh, Mercadona, Mercadona carries about 8,000 products. Uh, in their stores, a typical supermarket chain carries about 40,000 products. 
If you um, look at Trader Joe's, they carry about 4,000 products. Again, it's Pickle Supermarket carries around 40,000. So all of these companies offer fewer products than their uh, competitors do. So the second choice that I found common among these companies is that they have this, uh, what I call the killer combination of job design, which is um, standardization and empowerment together. So on the one hand, remember the retailer employee that I told you about, how she said to me that she felt like she, you know, they were throwaways who were a dime a dozen, dozen just human robots. Um, the, the employees of these companies certainly don't feel like uh, robots. So on the one hand, these companies standardize all the routine tasks that would really benefit from efficiencies, uh, consistencies like shelving merchandise, uh, receiving merchandise, checking people out at the cash register, etc. But at the same time, they empower their employees to improve those standards. And they also empower their employees to make decisions for their local customers. Now, you might be wondering, well, these companies have tens of thousands of people. How can they give um, that many people decision-making authority? Well, they can do that because they have lots of different controls in place. First, they can do that because they've invested in their people. They've hired the right people into their organization. So hiring is one way of control. Second, they monitor performance very closely. And, 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 and third, you know, they monitor performance and, and, and so, some of these um, design incentives that are, that are related to the, type, you know, the uh, customer service or, or some of the decisions that employees make. So, so they have mechanisms, control mechanisms in place that ensure that empowered employees are actually making the right decisions for their customers and for, for their uh, companies. So, so that's the second decision, the combination of standardization and empowerment. Um, the third one is cross-train. So in a service environment like retail, uh, customer traffic changes from time to time. If you cross-train your employees to perform different tasks, both customer-facing tasks and non-customer-facing tasks, then when the customers are there, your employees can focus on customer management. And when customers are not there, they can do lots of other tasks, like shelving merchandise, ordering merchandise, checking inventory record accuracy, et cetera. So all of these companies cross-train their employees to be able to perform uh, multiple tasks. Cross-training works for them. It makes sure that employees are always efficient. Cross-training works great for employees because they're able to do a bunch of different things and they're more motivated to do their jobs when they're cross-trained. And cross-training works for customers because um, any employee can help them. You know, if, you, if, if, if there's a long line at the cash register, somebody shelving merchandise can go open another cash register because they know, they know how to. In fact, all of the decisions offer less, standardize and empower, cross-train, and then the fourth one that I will mention to you in just a minute are not only good for customers because it increases customer service, they're also good for companies because they improve the productivity of employees and they reduce costs and, 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 and they um, increase sales. They're also good for employees because they make jobs better jobs. So, so cross-train is the third one. Now let me go through the, the, the final one, which is um, these companies also operate with Slack. So in many environments, what I have seen, in fact, one of my early research papers was on understaffing and the cost of understaffing. But in many retail environments, we see that um, companies tend to understaff their environments So because they want to reduce their labor costs. They try to minimize the number of people. They, they try to get as much as possible with as few people as possible. But these model retailers, instead of earning on the side of having too few people, they are on the side of having too many people. They operate with Slack. Uh, operating with Slack makes sure that employees are not rushed so they can do their jobs accurately, uh, so they don't have problems like phantom stuckouts and data inac inaccuracy. Operating with Slack makes sure ensures that they can offer better customer service. And op operating with Slack also ensures that employees can be part of process improvement or product improvement. So. So these are the these are the four different um, choices that the companies make that transform the investment in people into higher performance. And what I want to mention is that these four choices work really nicely when they're all made together. 
And these four choices also work very nicely when companies invest in their people. So I don't recommend to anyone to take just one of these choices. That, that tends to be the tendency with benchmarking. You look at a highly successful organization and you try to find out what, what they do so well. And somebody says, well, this is what they do well. Offer less, standardize and empower, cross-train, operate with Slack, and invest in people. And you say, okay, I'm going to take cross-train and standardize and empower from this list and implement it. So this is not, you know, the, these different choices form a system together. So, so, so don't try any one of the pieces um, at home on 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 their own. Um, so, 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 so this good job strategy um, leads to good jobs, obviously. Uh, it leads to they, it leads to low prices and it leads to amazing performance. Uh, these all of these four companies are generate great returns for for their shareholders, and moreover, the good job strategy also enable companies to adapt to changes in their environments. Uh, and let me give you one example of how that's possible. So in 2008, there was an economic crisis. And in the economic crisis, lots of different companies tried to reduce their costs and hence reduce their prices so that they could offer better deals for their customers. Um, and, um, and, 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 and in 2008, we had almost a natural experiment happening with two different companies that, two different retailers that tried to reduce their costs in different parts of the world. One was Mercadona in Spain and the other one was Walmart uh, in the United States and they both tried to adapt in a similar way. They both tried to reduce their product variety. Again, if you can if you can reduce your product variety, you can reduce lots of costs throughout your supply chain and really reduce your prices for your customers. Well, in the case of Walmart, reducing trying to reduce product variety uh, did not really work. So Walmart's uh, customers went into Walmart stores. They couldn't find what they were looking for, and they left without buying anything. In fact, Walmart saw its uh, sales decline several quarters in a row. And Walmart's um, chief merchandising officer ended up leaving the company. At the same time, around the same time, Mercadona implemented the exact same thing. They tried to reduce their product variety at the time from 9,000 products to 8,000 products. And they were able to do this successfully, and they were able to reduce their prices by 10%. Now, why did the product variety reduction strategy work at Mercadona versus at Walmart? Here is my, um, here is my explanation. First of all, Mercadona's employees, Mercadona already offers less, so Mercadona's employees are very familiar with the products that they sell. So if a customer went into the Mercadona store and they were looking for something and that something was no longer available, the employee who is knowledgeable about the products, is a, was able to tell the customer, look, we don't have that anymore, but here's a good substitute. And, and, and by the way, we reduced our prices by 10% as a result of this. Um, Mercadona's employees could do this because they are empowered to talk to customers. Mercadona's employees could do this because they were cross-trained, so anyone could stop what they were doing and talk to the customers. And Mercadona's employees, again, could do this because Mercadona operates with Slack. Employees are not rushing to get their jobs done as fast as possible. They have time to talk to the customers. So, so Mercadona was really able to take advantage of this and reduce their product variety and reduce their prices by 10%. And the result was a, a great increase in their market share. So what you see in this chart is Mercadona's market share and how it evolved from 2008 to 2012. And you see that in 2008, their market share was around 15%, and in 2012, it was about 20%. That is the power of the good job strategy. Being able to adapt to market changes, the local, um, to different conditions, is, 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 is a very, uh, very powerful, uh, very powerful thing. So, so, so I'm, I'm getting um, close to, 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 the, to the end here, and then we'll open up for uh, discussion. So the good job strategy that, that I have observed um, that work at these highly successful companies is not just about paying employees more. It's about making very smart choices, um, and it's about making smart choices that work for employees, customers, and investors. 
And it is a strategy. Uh, the good job strategy is not the only strategy that leads to um, financial performance. It is possible to make money at the expense of employees. It's even possible to make money at the expense of customers. But the good job strategy is a strategy in which everyone wins. Customers win, in investors win, and employees win. And, and the icing on the cake is that the good job strategy is a strategy where society also wins. Right now, we live in an economy where almost one in four people have a job, one in four working adults, not just kids, but working adults, have a job that doesn't um, allow them to make a decent living. So if, if, if there were more companies implementing the good job strategy, uh, it would certainly be better not just for companies and their uh, customers and employees, but also for our um, society. So, so I want to um, end with one final thing and then open, open it up to uh, questions. But that is, uh, I want to end with meaning and dignity. And I want to end with a quote with one of my favorite employees who uh, work at Quick Trip. Her name is uh, Patty Donovan. This is Patty, um, her picture. And Patty, so she, Patty works at Quick Trip. Again, Quick Trip is a convenience store chain. So part of Patty's job is to clean toilets, clean the gas pumps. Um, she works the cash register. She shelves merchandise. But when I talked to Patty, she told me about how her jobs mean so much more. She totally felt meaning and dignity in what she did. And she said to me, she said, you are working with 12 or 14 people. They go out and they touch 12 or 14 people. So I get to make a really big impact in so many people's lives just by trying to get them to see what Quick Trip's ending goal is. And that's for everybody to be successful and everybody to be happy. Now, I hope that those of you who are listening, you'll take this message and you'll share it with 12 to 14 people around you um, and, 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 and tell them that if good jobs are possible at a place like convenience store, then they are possible everywhere. We just need to get more companies to adopt the good job strategy. So thank you, and now I will uh, we'll open it up for questions. Great, thank you uh, very much, Lena. We've had a number of questions coming in as you've been speaking, so uh, I, I will perhaps just try to ask a few of those while people continue to uh, to ask questions. Uh, and uh, one set of questions that was uh, was coming in, I'll just try to sort of uh, put them together into a, into a compound question, it had to do with a couple of things. One was, as you think about the four factors that you've identified, is your sense that there's kind of a minimum level uh, that, a, that a company needs to strive to achieve in each of those areas? And also, is it about the absolute level of that performance relative to other companies, or is it the change? So that you mentioned that you know reducing the number of uh, offers as opposed yeah. to having a low number of offers. In absolute terms. Yep. Yeah, and it's hard to hard to say because there is no absolute number that really works for any particular company. Let me just stick to that offering less because it has a number, so 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 it's easier. So if you look at Costco, Costco offers four thousand products. If you look at Mercadona, Mercadona offers eight thousand products. The reason Mercadona offers a lot more is because their strategy is to be the supermarket where a person, a family, can complete their entire shopping. So for them. Doing that with 4,000 is just not enough. Mm -hmm. uh, but for Costco, they don't have that, um, that, that, that strategy, and as a result, they can get away with offering a lot fewer. But I think there's a mentality in these, in these companies that we only do what adds value to the customer, and we're not, going to do, we're not going to do more, and we're not going to do less. And we are a low-cost provider, mm -hmm. and we're going to do things that are consistent with our positioning in the market. Great, great. So there were also some questions that uh, were coming in, and again, I'll try to put two into one here. Uh, part one is, if this is uh, makes such obvious business sense, why isn't everyone doing it? Uh, and the other side of that was, if, if everyone is doing, if every employer is doing this, do you lose your competitive advantage in terms of uh, how what good an employer your yep. employees actually feel that you are? Okay, <laughs> so, so I get these, these are probably the questions that I get uh, the most often, and I'm not sure if I have a great answer, because the first one, the first question, if this is so good, right, if, if it's 
generates great value for everyone and it allows companies to adapt. Why aren't other companies doing it? Um, there is not a single answer to that, but there are lots of different answers. So, so the first one is that the good job strategy is a long-term strategy. It requires a long-term mindset because you make an investment in labor, you make an investment in your operations with the expectation that you are going to receive a long-term benefit of that investment. And like a lot of people, uh, companies tend to be too short-term focused rather than long-term. So that's, that's one of the reasons. Uh, the second reason is that the good job strategy is really hard. I mean, it's not just about paying people more. You have to get lots of things right, and you have to achieve excellence in operations. I, when I talk to my students, I tell them, you know, excellence is a lot harder to achieve than mediocrity. Um, so, so, I mean, I, I mean so, sometimes I liken the good job strategy to regular exercise, right? The regular exercise, we know that it's good for us, it makes us live longer, it, it even makes us um, smarter, apparently, but most of us don't do regular exercise because it requires a long-term view, it requires discipline, and it requires hard work, and we have to do it every single day. Uh, so the good job strategy is like regular exercise. It's good, but it's, but it's also hard. And another reason why companies don't do it is because it's possible to make money not following the strategy. You can also make money following the bad job strategy, um, and, and a lot of companies do. So these are the reasons of why we don't see lots of companies uh, following the good job strategy. Uh, none of them could be, should be an excuse for not following it. Uh, now, the thing about if everybody did this, would there be a competitive advantage? Absolutely, because not everybody will be able to implement this strategy as successfully. Mm -hmm. So, again, we will see those companies that really have great management, great operations, be able to come ahead of their competitors. Right. And, in fact, now, I mean, now lots of companies, IKEA, Gap, we, we are hearing in the news that a lot of other companies are increasing their wages, and, and a question that gets asked to me all the time is, now is this going to be a disadvantage to other companies that are able to attract good employees? And I say no, because the good job strategy is a lot more than just paying more. It, it's a hard strategy to implement. Thinking about that point about investing uh, in, in people, we've perhaps seen that companies are becoming less willing to invest long term in their people in their development and training because perhaps they're worried that that investment is portable, they can take it to uh, to, to other jobs, uh, and, and it becomes very expensive to keep those people. Yeah. Uh, have you seen that kind of issue? And I mean, I've talked to so I've talked to the executives at, at these companies to see if they if they have seen a difference in their workforce, um, and and they they tell me they have not really. I mean, they, their employee turnover is really hard, so really low. So clearly, the people in whom they have invested are staying with them, even though we might associate the, the new workforce as one that's very portable and, mm -hmm. and willing to go from one job to the other. Yeah, yeah, great. Another set of questions, and uh, I think you've already predicted this as well, where you, you spend a lot of time talking about the retail uh, in, industry at the moment, and uh, there are folk, it turns out, from other industries, but also from other sectors, like government, who are curious about whether these principles uh, would apply. In particular, some questions, uh, for example, what about uh, industries where uh, wages are high and the empowerment is high, and is there still an, a good job strategy that these firms should be pursuing? Yeah. Um, I, I think that the principles apply to a wide range of settings. I haven't studied every setting to be able to say, and, 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 and I don't want to make the strategy bigger than what it is, but when you look at each of those components, um, offer less, standardize and empower, cross-train, operate with Slack, these are actually not my theories. <laughs> These are what we had seen uh, originally in different industries, especially in manufacturing, and these same set of practices produce excellence in those other industries. So in the book, I give examples from a wide range of settings, from distribution centers to airlines to manufacturing about how each of these decisions uh, play a role in that particular environment. Great. Moving on, you, you, you mentioned earlier that uh, one of the companies was publicly traded that, that you studied, and some people are asking uh, specifically about that. It's well known that, uh, that those publicly traded companies are often just going quarter to quarter mm -hmm. trying to match the analysts' expectations. With that kind of short-term pressure, 
how can these long term investments be something that are that are sustainable? You know, I think we have to we have to work on two things. One is on the company side, we have to not use this as an excuse anymore because there are investors who are looking for long term opportunities. Um, there are investors who are attracted to Costco because Costco will do things that other companies won't do. There are investors who are attracted to uh, companies like Amazon, which doesn't implement a good job strategy, perhaps, but they are obsessed with their with their customers. So, and and uh, and so, I think we shouldn't use this as as an excuse. Yes, it is hard if you are a public company uh, to implement this, but if you are clear about what you are doing, if you clearly communicate your strategy to Wall Street and say this is how it works and this is what we get in return, then you, you would be able to manage those expectations so much better. Jim Sinegal, the, the founder and the CEO of Costco for a long time, was in my class a couple of weeks ago and my, many of my students asked this question about how do you manage Wall Street make ex expectations and he said early on it was difficult because they kept asking, they kept asking, they kept putting pressure to reduce labor costs and then he said but well, then they saw that we were performing great. So they started asking less and less. So, so, so I think that is um, that is manageable. I think we also have to do a good job, better job of talking to the investment community, to perhaps outside analysts and and to that community, and give this message to them and tell them about this long-term sustainable strategy that works very well, but how uh, with short-term pressures it might be much harder to sustain. Is is is. You know, on that note, is, is a bad job strategy really sort of a, a, a problem mostly for large companies, or does this apply equally to startups and growth companies? And I think equally, and the same thing with good job strategy too. Um, it, it it would apply equally to small or or large companies. That's, uh, I think one of the things that perhaps we would think about in small companies is it's easier to to, to incentivize people on yes. the financial piece of this and. Uh, well, one thing I was wondering is, you know, you talk about one of your slides, you mentioned uh, paying bonuses, for example. Yep. Is, is that kind of incentive very vital here, or is, just, is, is high salary without a bonus uh, a, a, a good option as well? So, so these companies differ in how they structure their incentives, but they, they all have the same mentality about investing in their people and giving them both decent wages so they can make a living, but also creating a high-performance environment through incentives or through other ways. Um, but coming back to the small businesses, I think it will be a lot easier for a small business to implement a good job strategy. It could be, you know, it could be implemented both as small and large companies, but it might be much easier for a smaller company to implement it than a larger company, just like how it's easier to build a house from scratch, like right. a good house from scratch than, than to renovate it. So I think um, if those who are on the call, who have, who are small business owners, they just shift their mentality um, and shift their mind, mindset that people are not a cost, but they are a strategic asset and think about how they can uh, build that strategic asset into their, um, inter, in their business. Uh, that will be wonderful. One, one other thing that I want to mention, I gave examples from Macadona and how, how much they invest in their people. 85% um, full-time employees, 5,000 euros spent on training. So small business owners might be saying, I can't afford to spend 5,000 euros on employee spending. I want to remind them that uh, Mercadona operates in a virtuous cycle, and they didn't start out with 5,000 euro investment in their people. They started out with the mentality. Um, in fact, Mercadona didn't start as a good job strategy company. It started as a bad job strategy company and made the transition into good jobs. But the transition happened with their mindset. And, and then the better they did, the more they could invest in their people. The better they did, the more they could invest in their people. So the virtuous cycle is really a cycle that mm -hmm. keeps getting better. Let's talk a little bit more about, about that uh, transition that you, that, that you just mentioned. You, you, you said a few times that these four factors are a system and they need to work together. Do these companies start somewhere and build on them, or are they trying to uh, do all of these things at once? So, so Mercadona was, if you looked at them in 1990, um, almost 25 years ago, you would have seen a retailer that didn't offer less. They offered a lot of products, just like a typical supermarket. They offered a lot of promotions. They changed their prices all the time. They offered bad jobs with low wages, unpredictable schedules. Um, and, and 
early 90s, they decided to shift to a different uh, strategy. And when they did their shift, they actually implemented multiple things at the same time. So on the one hand, they changed their um, product offering from one of large variety to a smaller variety, and they eliminated promotions. And at the same time, they implemented total quality man management, which meant that now they had to invest in their operations and they had to invest in their people. So Macadona was an example of a company that made the transition pretty much all at the same time. It took them a while to implement everything, uh, but, the, but they changed multiple things at the same time. Some of what you just described sound like uh, sort of a very systematic and strategic change that people might think must necessarily then come from the very senior executives or from the CEO. Certainly that must be one model, but is it possible for this kind of change to happen to sort of thrive the organization in a more distributed way? I don't think so. I haven't studied it enough. I, didn't, I haven't studied implementation enough to be able to give you a firm answer, but I think it has to come from the top because lots of different things have to change. The mentality has to change. So I think unless it comes from the top, I'm not sure if it will be um, powerful. So let, let's say perhaps that of the several hundred people that are listening to us now, hopefully we have a, maybe we have a CEO, but if we have some folk who are not CEOs, how can they communicate this effectively to the, your message to within their organization and get the senior executives to pay attention to this? So, so I think the, f the first thing that needs to be done is they have to convince people that there is a good job strategy, that this strategy exists. Because oftentimes when I talk about it, um, companies that don't implement the good job strategy, the tendency is to find an excuse for why it might not work. Um, so they will say, oh, Costco can do this because they're a membership club. Trader Joe's can do this because they sell strange products. Um, so, so I think the first one is to, to, to believe that there is a good job strategy and convince the team that there is a good job strategy. And then the second is to make a long-term commitment to it. Mm -hmm. And make that commitment clear to, to, to the executive teams, make that commitment clear to employees, and for public companies, make that commitment loud and clear to both their boards and to their investors. Mm -hmm. because they won't be able to turn on the switch, implement a good job strategy, and a quarter later, uh, it seems that things will be great. This is a long-term strategy, so, so, so they need to um, highlight that this is a long-term strategy. To expand on that point, actually, one of the things that we teach is that for many investments, you have to go through a worse before better yes, phase. Absolutely. Do you think that's necessarily true in, 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 in the sphere of these kinds of changes? Or oh, absolutely. Might there be a can you get better right away kind of? Uh, we see that over and over in operational changes. When you implement total quality management, first it gets worse before it gets better. Um, this, this is when you implement a new IT system. First it gets worse before it gets better. So, so we need patience. And how, how, how much that dip takes, how long that dip takes, depends on the magnitude of the change. So we need a lot of patience from investors and, and, and from executives if they want to get to excellence. I think you mentioned the time scale in one of the, when you were talking about one of the examples, but could you, could you just perhaps quantify that a little bit? No, I can't. Years, months, I, decades, we you know, years? that would be so. That would be my next book because now there are luckily there are companies that are approaching me that that want to implement this good job strategy. So once I have a good enough sample, um, I will write the next book, which will talk about you know depending on your setting, how big you are, and and. Um, and, 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 and your current conditions, how long it will take you to implement this. But right now, I could make it up, Peter, <laughs> but, but I would rather not. If there's anybody listening right now who's interested in uh, being part of your next study, perhaps uh, they, can, uh, they can reach out and, uh, and get in touch. So perhaps just as be to begin uh, wrapping the, the discussion up, uh, one thing that uh, comes to my mind, this is, there seems to be tremendous opportunity here, and you've talked about sort of the requirement for uh, for investment and being very thoughtful and being very strategic about this. So, actually, how do people get started? What's something if if someone is convinced by uh, your argument today, you know, what do they what can they do this afternoon, depending on what time zone they're in, or tomorrow or next week? Go on Amazon.com and buy the good job strategy. <laughs> that's, that's a, a good start. <laughs> that's a joke, but but it is. I mean, I I think when you when you have only you know 45 minutes to talk about it, it's it's not 
possible to, to, to put the whole argument uh, in place and all the different components together. But it is when, when you look through these choices and how they work together, they are very reasonable uh, decisions. So I think a thorough understanding of these principles will probably be the first, uh, first step. Great. Thank you very much. So, Professor uh, Zenaton, uh, it's been a pleasure. Thank you for sharing this, uh, this time with us and Thank your you. thoughts. And uh, for everyone on the call, we'll be continuing a Facebook uh, discussion uh, after, uh, afterwards, and we'll push the link for that uh, very shortly so that you can come to our Facebook page and continue a discussion uh, in text with Professor Zenaton. So just while we're uh, finishing up now, I'd also like to mention that those of you that are familiar with our executive education programs here at MIT Sloan, uh, Professor Tom teaches in uh, two of those programs at the moment. We're showing you those on the screen, developing a leading edge operation strategy and strategies for sustainable business. Uh, those are two and three day, three day programs offered uh, here at MIT, and we'd love to see some of you here uh, in the future in person. Uh, and with that, I think it remains for me to uh, thank everybody uh, for uh, being here with us. Thank Professor Ton one more time uh, for this live uh, online session. Uh, and thank you again for sticking around and continuing the chat on Facebook. Thank you.